With us today, we have Dr. Filippo Menser. Dr. Menser is a distinguished professor of informatics and computer science at Indiana University. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You've written that one of the first consequences of the attention economy is the loss of high quality information. Do you think you can elaborate on that process and how that happens? Yes, absolutely. This idea of the attention economy uh, we have to attribute it to uh, Simon, uh, who was a, a, an incredible economist, and, and he started noticing that uh, generating information was getting cheaper and cheaper, so predicted that in the future, the scarce um, good would not be the information itself, as it has been throughout history, but our capability to pay attention to it. And, and, and this has become true as uh, our technology has advanced and the cost of producing information has decreased, uh, you know, we've seen benefits of that so that, you know, now, you know, the democratization of information, everybody can become a, a producer of information. But then uh, in the last few years, we've started to realize also the possible negative consequences of that because we are so flooded from, with information and we don't have good ways of um, selecting and filtering uh, so that we can devote our attention to quality information, for example, to things that are true or useful. Uh, it used to be when information was rare that uh, newspapers editors played that role for us. And we had a number of trusted editors and intermediaries. Now that wasn't necessarily ideal. There, you know, It was very much of an elite uh, activity and few people could it dominated um, basically the space, but uh, and and so uh, but now uh, you know with the, with the good of the democratization, we now also see that um, it, it most people um, cannot tell, and so especially people who access news through social media, um, you know what they see instead of being determined by you know professional editors uh, who devote their life to figuring out what is true and what is accurate and what is important. Uh, instead, what we see is mediated by algorithms uh, who uh, are often designed with um, goals that are different from, you know, from, from exposing us to useful information, but rather to, you know, to make money for, by keeping us on platforms and also by our friends. And our friends are definitely not expert editors. <laughs> we are not expert editors. We are often driven by all kinds of, uh, you know, cognitive and, and social biases that decide what we pay attention to, like what makes us mad. Well, that's not necessarily what informs us the best. So all of these, um, all of these different factors now uh, account for uh, what we pay attention to. And we've even developed models showing that, um, in, in an environment in which you can only pay attention to a fraction of what is out there, uh, inevitably um, some things will go viral. This is, this is an environment like a social media ecosystem where you have a network of people connected to each other, sharing information. Um, and you know, if, if you had infinite attention and you could look at everything and decide what to, what to pay attention to, you know, then the world would be good. But in, in reality, we can only pay attention to a very, very small fraction. And in this case, some things are still going to get a lot of attention and, and to, to go viral, uh, but those things are not necessarily good things. Um, you know, even if we have no notion of quality, some things at random will, will, will go viral and uh, the there's zero correlation with quality. Uh, and then we developed additional models, a little bit more, slightly more realistic, where we can imagine that people actually can tell, uh, can tell the quality of different pieces of information to which they're exposed. And they preferentially share things that are um, higher quality. But even in that situation, when, uh, when, when we have information overload, where the, when the amount of information that we can pay attention to is a small fraction of what's out there, still there is very, very low correlation between popularity and quality. In other words, a lot of junk goes viral. And this is just inevitable consequence of the, of the attention economy, of the fact that it is so cheap to produce information and we can't possibly process all of it. So inevitably, we are going to ex be exposed to a lot of junk. And that, that's how the attention economy creates a vulnerability for us. Um, 
at the observatory on social media, you explore the emergence of these echo chambers. Can you kind of explain how that happened and uh, the experiment you used to study that? Yes. So um, this is a this is an important topic because one of the let's say the vulnerabilities of of social media platforms is to um, encourage the or accelerate the formation of echo chambers, which are groups of users where um, one is mostly exposed to opinions that are similar to their own. Therefore, this is likely to reinforce their existing beliefs and biases and decrease the chances that they are exposed, that one is exposed to information from different points of view, which often is information that fact checks misinformation that one is exposed uh, from one's own group. So, you know, whether you're conservative or liberal, you may be in a filter bubble or in an echo chamber where you're exposed to a lot of information that is, you know, maybe not false, but misleading perhaps, or that encourages your, your existing biases. And you're unlikely to see um, information that would check that, that would put that in a broader context, that would help you see things in a more, um, in a more objective way. And uh, so it turns out that uh, actually a very, very basic mechanism that are part of our own cognitive biases and part of natural things that you can do on all social media platforms make it basically inevitable that we um, end up in groups that are highly homogeneous and that are somewhat segregated from, from, from other groups. Uh, so we've developed a model that demonstrates this. Um, so again, this is a model where we simulate a, a social network, an online social network where people share information with each other. And you can imagine that the information that you share is correlated with, with your own, you know, with your own beliefs. Um, and, and that you have some chance of being influenced by what you observe, by what is shared by your friends, as long as that is close enough to your own opinions. Um, uh, you know, if you see something that is, you know, completely different from your opinions, perhaps it will influence you less. This is based on actual, you know, uh, experiments in, um, so this is a well understood effect. And then the other basic ingredient that is present in all platforms is the fact that we can uh, not only select who we follow, their friends, uh, but also unselect them, right? So if somebody that you follow or that you're friends with post something that you find very offensive, with a single click, you can mute them or, um, you know, or, or unfollow them. In fact, this is what platforms encourage us to do, right? So if you see something that you think of uh, offensive and you try to report it on, on Twitter or Facebook, the first thing that they'll say is, well, you can just unfollow this person or you can mute this person. And you have to do several clicks if you say, no, 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 that's not what I want to do. I want to report that they posted something you know, dangerous or um, harmful or something. So platforms definitely make it very easy and even encourage unfollowing uh, people that we disagree with. And, and in, in, in simulations, you can see very easily that with these two basic ingredients, very, very quickly, people sort themselves out into groups that are very homogeneous uh, and, and segregated in the sense that you basically have no chance of seeing different opinions. Even if you start from a situation of, you know, of, of uh, very heterogeneous opinions uh, and people being connected to different opinions, but very, very quickly, if you have these two ingredients, uh, all, that, all that will go away and you will have completely separated and completely homogeneous um, uh, groups. And there's a lot of work in this area. This is one model. Other people have developed other similar models um, that make different kinds of assumptions. For example, you might not even know the opinion of somebody else, but simply decide to, you know, to follow or unfollow people based on um, based on the information that they share. Um, and uh, and so it, it's it's pretty inevitable. And, and in fact, empirically, when we actually go and get data from uh, plat social media platforms. And we measure, um, you know, the, how the structure of the social network co is connected to people's opinions. We find this very, very, very strong homophily. Homophily is a technical term. It means, uh, you know, like of the same. It means that in a network, you're most likely to be connected to people that are similar to you. Um, so that's, uh, you know, 
the clear uh, mark of this um, of this community structure where where each community is very homogeneous, and we find this very very strongly on multiple platforms and and um, you know. Uh, it has been true as we have measured this over the last uh, 10 years or so. It's been invariant. So, uh, the, uh, so that's, that's, that's a natural consequence of the fact that we access information uh, through social media. Kind of going on the lines of echo chambers, we talk a lot about social diffusion. I was just curious how social diffusion impacts the information that people see on their social media platforms. Well, this is like the basic idea of, of social media. You you share stuff and your friends see it. And uh, if your friends are similar to you, um, then uh, social diffusion means that most of the information to which you are exposed online is information that tends to conform with your existing opinion and is unlikely to challenge them. Um, and, you know, we have these very, very strong uh, cognitive biases. You know, we, you know, we have evolved in tribes where members of our tribes are friends and everybody else is the enemy. Um, and, and this unfortunately finds uh, reinforcement in a uh, social media platform. So our, our, our own tendency, as we were talking about a moment ago, to you know, put put ourselves into echo chambers uh, is is um, has as a consequence um, the fact that we have a very biased view of the world. Um, even if uh, somebody posts, uh, let's say, some false claim, and maybe that claim is fact checked quickly, and there exists out there information that shows that that in fact is not true, we are very unlikely to see that fact check. Uh, that fact check probably is spreading through a different echo chamber, mm -hmm. um, and and we just don't see it. So even if the true and accurate information is out there, um, the natural uh, structure and and dynamics of of social diffusion make it unlikely that we are um, that we are exposed to it. Furthermore, uh, within within a, a a social community where you know there's lots of um, there's lots of triangles. So in other words, fr friends of my friends are likely to be my friends. So we have common friends. And, uh, and this makes it such that as soon as uh, two or a few people share something within one of these tight communities, then many, many, many people are exposed to multiple exposures of that. So in other words, um, the structure of the community in social diffusion makes, makes it such that you will immediately see that many people are sharing the same thing. And uh, one of the interesting features of um, opinion, uh, uh, opinion dynamics is that we are more likely to accept a fact or to imitate a behavior or to believe something when it comes from multiple sources. This also comes from uh, you know, ancient social and cognitive behaviors, right? If, if you see everybody starts running, you start running too. You don't know why, but you assume that people are not crazy. So there must be a reason. This is the same in social media. If you see that a million people are sharing a video, you want to watch that video. You can't help it. And if all your friends are, you know, saying that, uh, you know, David is a murderer, you think, oh, there, there must be something. But in fact, uh, in fact, within these tight communities, you get the impression, you see that many people are sharing something simply because of the structure of the network itself. These people may not be independent of each other. It, there may be one source, but because a few people have shared it into this tight community where there's lots of triangles, you all of a sudden see it as coming from many, many different sources. Uh, but these sources are not independent. Whereas, you know, if you see zebras running in the forest, they're probably all independent. Maybe, maybe somebody has seen a lion. Uh, but, uh, but here, um, it's possible that this is you just have the appearance of something being a wide held opinion in your in your tribe and you have a very strong pressure to adopting that opinion um, even though in reality um, you know in reality maybe that was something that came from just uh, one or two uh, sources so 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 those those are additional vulnerabilities that come from the dynamics of information diffusion um, uh, in, in social networks. Great, great. 
you also spend a lot of your time researching like, social bots on social media. And I was kind of curious if you could explain what are the dangers that social bots present to social media users. Yes. Yeah, social bots are basically automated, more or less automated account, accounts. That, now, some of them are perfectly innocuous and even helpful, um, but, uh, but the, the, the kind of social bots that are dangerous that we study are the ones who impersonate humans. And they're used as sock puppets or as ways to amplify uh, information. So we see that they can be, you know, you can pay to get uh, to get a lot of uh, fake accounts to follow you and create the appearance that you're popular, or to retweet your content to create the appearance that the content is um, is, is spreading virally. And so these social bots can are dangerous because they can manipulate our opinion. They can leverage. Uh, you know, those cognitive and social biases that I was talking about a minute ago, where if you get the impression that a lot of people are talking about something, there must be something there. Well, you can create that impression by just paying somebody or, you know, writing a, some code that creates the appearance that a lot of people are talking about something. Whereas, in fact, maybe there is just a single entity that controls all of those all of those accounts. And in so doing, you can sort of uh, manipulate, uh, literally manipulate uh, manipulate people. So this was something that was discovered since the early days of social media. We, we found the first instance of a social bot um, in 2010 or 2000, yeah, 2010, during the midterm elections then. And, you know, we coined the term social bots. We did not know what it was. We were just surprised. We were mapping these diffusion networks, seeing who was retweeting whom. And we thought that there was you know, an error in our code where we saw two nodes with a, a link between them that was huge, like it was like occupying the whole screen because the, you know, the thickness of the edge in this network for us was representing the number of retweets between two accounts. And we thought it was an error in the code. And so we looked at it and there were these two accounts that were retweeting each other tens of thousands of times. So then we realized, okay, what, who are they? What is this? And we realized that they were just doing this automatically. There is no way that a human could be doing that. And they were just promoting a particular political candidate. Um, so, so we call them, oh, these are bots. These are, these are automated. So they're, they're social bots. And, and then since then, we've been studying this a lot. And also we develop machine learning tools to detect when an account is likely um, you know, automated. And it doesn't mean that it is autonomous, right? Um, you know, it doesn't mean that you have a, a you know a bot there that acts in a completely autonomous way. There may be a human. There's usually a human behind it, uh, or an organization. Um, so the automation in that is in that you use the uh, application programming interfaces pr provided by the platforms to control these accounts. So you can write a few lines of code and have a thousand accounts post something or retweet something. Uh, even though that post or the retweet or the choice of the content that is being spread comes from, from a human. Um, so we still would call these, you, you know, we still call them bots because, because we are using the technology, we're using programming to create the appearance of many, uh, the false appearance of, 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 of many pushing some opinion. And, you know, as we have developed uh, better machine learning tools to detect these bots, then people who uh, want to abuse platforms have become smarter and develop better, uh, better algorithms. And so we've seen over the years, bots becoming more sophisticated and also uh, less automated, more human controlling them. Uh, and, and also uh, at this point, uh, we see a lot of these kind of false uh, coordinated networks that are even not uh, that are driven by real people. Um, that in in developing in the developing worlds, there are, there are, there is a lot of very cheap labor, so that you can actually hire uh, you know an army of people and pay them very little amounts of money uh, to post on your behalf or to create the impression uh, that something is happening. Or you can hack account use hacked accounts or. Or you can get uh, supporters to post on your behalf. That we've seen apps uh, uh, by political action committees uh, that ask their supporters to give them their, uh, you know, username and password, their credentials for for social media systems, and then and then these apps post automatically on behalf of of these people. 
Um, so basically, these people become social bots. Uh, they, you know, they give permission to an entity to control an army uh, of accounts. So these are all things that, in our opinion, create very strong vulnerability because they, you know, they have the potential to manipulate uh, what we see. Um, you also talked about how adding friction to social media uh, interactions can kind of limit disinformation on these social media platforms. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on this concept of adding friction? Yeah, the concept of friction comes directly from the idea of the attention economy at information overload. We, we talked about it earlier, right? The, the idea that just because we, we can't handle all the information that we see and we therefore are more likely to share things that are low quality, e even if we would rather not, um, and that contributes to lowering the overall quality of information in the system. So the natural, you know, the natural countermeasure to that would be to decrease, uh, you know, the amount of information to which we are exposed, uh, so that so that we would have more time to digest it. Uh, and so friction is 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 a way to do that, right? Over the years, you could think of, you know, from every technology that comes in, you could go back to the press. But even if we just talk more recently about the last 10 years, you know, with, with the web or, or 20 years with the web and then blogs and then wikis and then, uh, you know, social tagging and then, and then, and then eventually social micro, micro blogs, the, the, the social media platforms that we have today, every step has made it easier to post something, to share some information you know, from having to create an entire website to just having to create an account to just typing in something close to text with a little bit of markup to just type in text to just typing on your phone. And then eventually you just clicking one tap on a screen. And right now we can share something with hundreds of people or more. So every step has decreased this friction, has decreased the cost of producing information. So given that some of the consequences of that have been negative in the ways that we have been discussing, uh, the, the natural counteraction would be, well, let's go back a little bit and increase the friction. Let's imagine that uh, people have to pay some kind of cost. It doesn't have to be monetary to produce something. Well, then you would think twice before you share something, right? If you, you know, think of the, the old expression, my two cents, right? We used to have to pay a stamp in order to send a message to one person. Now, basically for free, we can send something to millions of people. So let's reintroduce the idea of, of a stamp. It could, be, it could be something that says, before you share, are you really sure you want to share this or maybe solve this little puzzle or you know, pay one cent uh, or, or, um, or simply look, you, you've already posted 10 things today. Wait until tomorrow. <laughs> you know, if you really want to post this, come back in an hour mm -hmm. and push another button. There are so many different ways in which you could add friction. And, uh, and, and the, the, the theory here is that doing that would just decrease the overall volume and give people a way to, um, you know, to think more um, meaningfully about what they want to, what they, what they really want to share how many times you, you know, you go back to something that you shared an hour later and you realize, oh, I, I maybe I shouldn't have shared that, right? So sometimes just thinking about it for a minute or an hour might let you think more carefully about what are the possible consequences of, of, uh, of producing or resharing or amplifying a piece of misinformation, a piece of information. It might also create time for platforms to fact check so that, uh, you know, maybe an hour later, you might have a label that says, oh, by the way, this has been fact checked by this fact checker. And it turns out that this information is disputed. Um, or it might be later that uh, you find, well, actually, you were retweeting an account that in the meanwhile, the platform has suspended because it turned out that it was an inauthentic account. So, uh, so these are all different ways in which we believe that adding friction might, might help. Now, the problem, of course, is that it might affect the bottom line of platforms. Um, and so the question is whether self-regulation is possible here or if we need some kind of government uh, regulation to uh, create incentives for platforms to do this.
Well, looks like we're out of time for today. Once again, we've been talking to Dr. Filippo Menser, who is a distinguished professor of informatics and computer science at Indiana University, and also the director of the Observatory of Social Media. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much.